Welcome everybody. Thank you for persevering. I'm very much looking forward to today's event, um, which is titled Freedom Narrative. This is the uh, colonial, the post-colonial and the deep colonial research cluster. We are co-organized by myself and my colleague, Isaac Jocelyn. Hi, Isaac. Um, I'm in the Department of English and Isaac is in the School for International Letters and Cultures and is a, a French professor. Um, we're grateful to the Institute for Humanities Research for our support of us. And we will be hosting at least one, if not two more events uh, later this semester. Um, more about that to follow with a single Zoom link in the next uh, probably two to three weeks. Information about that will be there. <clears throat> um, so what we'll do is, let me look at the time because of the lost time. So it's 1.50. Um, uh, Bina Mehta will be presenting for about 20. She's very, she's very precise. She emailed me and said, I may go two to three minutes over. So I think we can trust her on that. We'll probably wind up at 22 and a half. And Keith Miller, <laughs> follow somewhere between 20 and 25 minutes. What I, do, I will introduce uh, first uh, Bina Mehta and give the title of her talk and a brief bio. She will speak, then I will do the same for Keith Miller. He will speak and then we'll have some time for Q&A. And as a reminder to everyone, this is being recorded. Please uh, mute yourselves. Um, and uh, actually Keith, could you go ahead and mute yourself? I'm gonna mute you. There you go. And wonderful. Uh, all right. So uh, Bina Mehta is a faculty associate in the Department of English um, at Arizona State University, where she earned her PhD in English literature in 2017. Uh, she works with late 19th to mid 20th century British, Indian, and Irish literature with an emphasis on post-colonial literary studies and post-structural Marxist and material culture theories. Her research produces ideas and approaches that help bridge divides among disparate perspectives found within cultural institutions and ideologies. She has presented her work at a number of national and international conferences. She is also an accomplished singer and has produced three music albums on Gujarati, Hindu, and Urdu lyric poetry with her husband. The title of her talk is Freedom Narrative of Aesthetic Apprehension the bird girl and post-coloniality <clears throat> versus a portrait of the artist as a young man. Welcome. And Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you all for attending. Good afternoon to all, first of all. Thank you for attending this event today. And um, as you heard, the title of my presentation is Freedom Narrative of Aesthetic Apprehension the Bird Girl and Postcoloniality in James Joyce's A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man. Can you all hear me okay? All right. <clears throat> While a steadfast consensus among scholars in the postcolonial field remains that the field foundationally concerns itself with emancipation strategies against continuing a new modes of imperial domination, one of the critical areas of debate concerns the meaning and forms of liberation that are feasible and meaningful to the social and cultural orders of the previous and current colonies. One of the, a key issue among these debates revolves around questions such as, do locally founded utopian ideals of freedom become absolutist? On the other hand, do discursive cosmopolitan ideals of freedom lack local resonance? Is it possible to articulate and practice a global cosmopolitan form of freedom that does not violate particular historical and local differences of a given culture. My presentation is based on my larger dissertation project where I examine these and related questions for multiple freedom narratives from both sides of the colonial divide. Here, I discuss the freedom narrative of aesthetic apprehension by James Joyce in his famous novel, A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, which I will refer to as a portrait. <clears throat> Due to the time constraint, I will limit the discussion to a few aspects of the freedom narrative. I would be happy to elaborate during the question answer session. <clears throat> James Joyce's A Portrait, 
written in early 20th century is a story of a young protagonist, Stephen Didalus, a subject in colonial Ireland. Stephen aspires to become an artist. As an artist, his goal is to, in quote, discover the mode of life or of art whereby his spirit could express itself in unfettered, his spirit could express itself in unfettered freedom, end quote. He conveys to his friend Davin as, that as an artist, in quote, he will fly by the nets of nationality, language, religion that hold a man's soul back from flight, end quote. In Joyce scholarship, Stephen's views and practice of art are understood as a form of transcendence or escape from the oppressive daily reality. Other scholars have suggested that art represents a form of defiance against his ideological subjection. <clears throat> in this presentation, I argue that art for Stephen, in fact, represents an integral relationship between the ideological discourses that oppress him as well as his autonomy from these discourses. In other words, I argue <clears throat> that the text of a portrait produces a construct of freedom through art that represents not a transcendence or escape from, nor a defiance of, but the artist's subjectivity's engagement with ideological discourses. Stephen, the artist, finds his freedom from ideology precisely by inhabiting ideology. I propose a broader role of Stevens aesthetics as Joyce's critical and comprehensive engagement with ideological discourses of his time, through which he simultaneously produces a post-colonial post -colonial form of emancipation. <clears throat> Methodologically, I apply and extend groundbreaking work on the notion of fetishism in anthropology, psychoanalysis, and post-colonial studies that discredit the fetish's conventional derogatory and pathological connotations and establish its critical cultural significance and possibility for yielding rich cultural analysis. Providing a brilliant genealogy and analysis of the idea of fetishism, William Piet suggests that the fetish embodies cultural, a cultural production of a creative and new form of social consciousness that arrives to negotiate irresolvable contradictions or clashes in cultural values. Extending theorization on fetishism by Pietz and other insights by Anne McClintock and Homi Baba, I argue that the fetish galvanizes and embodies a struggle between a culture's desire for wholeness against the culture's confrontation with contradictory values that divide this wholeness. By promoting engagement between these two forms that represent identity as at once one and many, whole and divided, when invoked for an emancipatory purpose in the colonial context, the fetish demonstrates a potential to invoke post-coloniality that is at once global and local. <clears throat> Specifically, I argue that the Burgal image that Stephen projects his autonomy on is a fetish image. This fetish image galvanizes cultural slash ideological contradictions in colonial Ireland, specifically contradictions founded in the relationship among ancient Irish traditional and gender norms and the cultural orders of language, Irish nationalism and Roman Catholicism that determine Stephen's colonial subjectivity. By projecting onto the bird girl, his wholeness as well as his divisions embedded in these cultural contradictions, I argue Stephen produces a post-colonial freedom construct. I discuss the language aspect first. <clears throat> Stevens' aesthetic theory is founded in the ideals of Thomas Aquinas that artistic perception involves three stages of wholeness, harmony, and radiance, or claritas. As I noted, Stephen projects his theory onto the bird girl, which is an image he encounters on the beach. Stevens' experience of this image involves an epiphany where she represents to him an advent of life. I suggest that Stephen perceives this image through these three stages of wholeness, harmony, and claritas. <clears throat> he first sees her as a whole, then he sees her as divided in parts which again refer to the whole of her, and finally he apprehends her image as the one that produces a silent stasis of aesthetic pleasure, the stage of radiance or claritas. I argue that his experience of her through these three stages of aesthetic apprehension can be interpreted through a theory of signification, which shows a subject's linguistic determination. This is one of the key notions I explore. However, due to the time constraint, I explain briefly how this theory applies to, to Stevens' perception of the bird girl image. <clears throat> Jacques Lacan defines the human subject as desire or lack. He also defines it as a signifier in language. 
Lacan suggests that after its birth, the human subject loses its access to the phenomenal plenitude with which it desires unity. However, the cultural orders or ideologies offer the human subject various ideals of sovereignty. The lacking human subject misrecognizes these ideals as its phenomenal plenitude and desires to achieve unity with these to make itself whole. <clears throat> However, in trying to achieve this unity, the subject reconfirms its divided and lacking status and yet continues this elaborate cycle during its lifetime. What I establish is the first two stages of aesthetic apprehension respectively refer to Stephen's projection of his desire for wholeness and his affirmation of lacks slash divisions onto the bird girl. In the final stage of Claritas, Stephen perceives a luminous silence stasis, a stage he suggests goes beyond desire or lack in his apprehension of the bird girl image. Stephen here seems to define the aesthetic freedom as that which moves beyond both his misperceived wholeness as well as his divided or lacking status within ideology and as that which in fact transcends ideology. <clears throat> Continuing with the theory of signification, I define his idea of the final stage of the silent stasis through Jacques Derrida's idea of the trace. While according to both Lacan and Derrida, transcending ideology is not possible, Derrida's ideas of the, of the trace as that which remains elusive or beyond signification thus unidentifiable within ideology explains Stephen's idea of the silent stasis. According to Derrida, all reality, including ideology, is textual, and thus something that remains beyond a signifier in language would also point to something that remains beyond ideology. Interestingly, Stephen says his destiny was to be elusive of the religious and cultural orders. Put simply, as per Derrida, the trace is released when ling linguistic signifiers are pitted against each other. <clears throat> Based on the above discussion, I suggest that Stephen's theory can be interpreted to suggest that when a subject as a signifier repeatedly attends to its lacking status within ideology, the conditions which refer to both its misperceived wholeness as well as division, it is also able to point to that which is released, the trace, the unidentifiable element within ideology. In other, wor in other words, as I discuss this later, Stevens' own discourse reflects this theoretical paradigm where he comes to believe <clears throat> that he will continue to be determined by ideologies, yet he will move outside of it by attending to his division. What I show is that through various metaphors of elusiveness and exile, such as impalpability, silence, invisibility, insubstantiality, the text projects onto the bird girl image, Stevens' misperceived wholeness and division that not only represent the linguistic, but also nationalist and Catholic determination of his colonized subjectivity. <clears throat> Next, I discuss the aspects of Irish nationalism and Roman Catholicism. The narrative of a portrait opens historically in 1880s during the Home Rule movement in Ireland. As many scholars agree, one way to interpret the ideological narratives in a portrait is to look at it as a narration of the gender dilemma, where Ireland's colonial context remains the key. The text associates Stephen's masculinity with the Irish nationalist as well as Roman Catholic discourses. The text draws attention to Stephen's diffidence towards his physical weaknesses as well as his shame and humiliation for his father's low social standing and their overall destitute lifestyle. He is unable to respect and identify with the manhood represented by his father. The text demonstrates a foundational aspect in his masculinity when during a severe illness, Stephen hallucinates and sees himself as Dave Parnell, his nationalist hero. The text here metaphorically conflates Stephen's narrative of his weakness and lack with Parnell's death. Realizing that, in quote, he had not died then, Parnell had died, end quote, Stephen says, he had not died, but he had faded out like a film in the sun. How strange to pass out of existence in such a way, not by death, but by fading out in the sun or by being lost and forgotten somewhere in the universe. <clears throat> Stephen expresses an unidentifiable and unutterable nature of his loss where without physical death, he finds himself invisible and lost. At other times, he invokes the experience of his masculinity with metaphors such as abyss and barren shell of the moon. These powerful metaphors of loss in their various invocations allude to entrenched Irish colonized masculinity. Joseph Valenti writes that within the imperialist discourse, conquerors were seen in quote, 
as the exponents of a principle coded and celebrated as masculine, and the concord, in quote, as the embodiment of a principle stereotyped and discounted as female, end quote. He notes these discourses also suggested that the Irish race was characterized by a nervous exaltation and feminine idiosyncrasy and designated it as naturally inferior. In other words, Stephen not only sees his masculinity as lacking, but also the loss and death he associates with his masculinity, both clearly connote to abjection, derogation, and humiliation he associates with femininity. Similarly, his relationship to Roman Catholicism remains contradictory as well. <clears throat> to be a good Catholic above all things is the religious precept Stephen is asked to live by. While acknowledging the authority of the all-knowing, all-seeing Roman Catholic God, he is unwilling as well as unable to conform to God's wishes due to, in his words, pride in his own sin, his savage desire, and brute-like lust. Later, a religious retreat instills shame and humiliation towards his body's proclivity to sin, and his soul sinks, in quote, in contrite peace, end quote. Yet, after being offered priesthood for his staunch adherence to the, adherence to the religious dictates, Stephen realizes that he will never be able to overcome the temptations of the flesh. Stephen's above references of shame for as well as pride in his sin show that Stephen sees himself as a fallen Adam or a Satan. L.P. Curtis points out that Victorian Anglo-Saxon prejudice saw the Irish as a race of savages. He notes that Paddy, the British stereotype of the, for the Irish, implied adjectives such as emotionally unstable, indolent, superstitious, primitive, dirty, vengeful, and violent. The colonial implications of Stephen's perception of himself as a fallen Adam or a defiant Satan suggest that he perceives his sexual desire as a sign of Irish savagery. It also shows how the British imperial narrative co-opts the Catholic precept. In this regard, <clears throat> the castigation of his hero Parnell for his adultery and the erasure of Parnell's masculinity as shameful by both the Catholic and the nationalist leaders alike indirectly reinforce and confirm to Stephen the British stereotype of the Irishman as savage and uncontrolled. Stevens' experience of his masculinity is also inextricably connect connected to his complex relationship with femininity. Stevens' psychological shame for his fallen, that is, effeminized and lacking masculinity, orients him partially negatively towards the feminine. His feeling of his betrayal by the feminine is reflected in one aspect of his emotional attachment to Mercedes the fiancé of Dumas' Avenger hero, Dante, who is Stephen's idol. Since Mercedes slights Dante by marrying his cousin after Dante's forced exile, and Dante later rejects her, Stephen, who longs to meet his own Mercedes, however, also plan on rejecting her after he finally meets her. On the other hand, Stephen also has a recurrent premonition that an end Mercedes in a magic moment would catalyze his emancipation. <clears throat> He says they would meet quietly, alone, surrounded by darkness and silence. And in that moment of supreme tenderness, he would be transfigured. Weakness and timidity and, in weakness, timidity and inexperience would fall from him in that magic moment. Stephen's contradictory relationship to the feminine can be explained by Christine Van Bohemian Sass view that the colonized Irish male has a double relationship to the feminine because the Irish nation is traditionally understood as female and maternal. <clears throat> she writes of him, while his cultural and racial marginality creates emasculating feminization, his identification with the collectivity of the nation represented as a female figure, often credited with extraordinary powers, offered an empowering feminization. Mercedes is that hope of salvation placed in front of Stephen by the same maternal Irish legend. What is critical to note in Stevens' discourse are the continued metaphors of silence, exile, impalpability, invisibility, unsubstantiality that denote his lacks as well as his definition of the phenomenal finitude. <clears throat> Having broadly outlined major contradictions that define Stevens' subjectivity through his religious and nationalist determination, I will now move on to the significance of Stevens' encounter with and his projection of his theory onto the bird girl. <clears throat> Fearing that priesthood would, in his words, end forever in time and eternity, his freedom, Stephen moved, moves towards the beach. 
on his way he imagines in quote a winged form flying above the waves and slowly climbing the air end quote the text makes it clear that this figure is icarus the mythological son the mythological uh, figure the son of the famed athenian artist didylus as the legend goes icarus who is given the wings of wax to fly out of a prison ignores the warning by his father not to fly too close to the sun and as he keeps soaring high his wings melt and he meets his death <clears throat> with trepidation stephen wonders if the hawk like man flying towards the sun is in quote a prophecy of the end he had been born to serve a symbol of the artist forging out of the sluggish matter of the earth a new soaring impalpable imperishable being end quote noticeable here is the intertextual element of stephen earlier seeing himself as fading out in the sun as he imagines himself as led parnell however here he invokes the same implied icarus with imperishableness in other words his invocation of himself as icarus refers to seeing himself as both the fallen as well as redeemed satan most significantly at another instance encountering birds stephen imagines the god named thoth the egyptian god of wisdom and writing with a bird or ibis head he connects the image of thoth with the hawk like man icarus expanding the meaning of the hawk like man seen before he encounters the bird girl he says the hawk like man whose name he bore soaring out of his captivity on osir woven wings of thoth the god of writers writing with a reed upon a tablet and bearing on his narrow ibis head the cursed moon this is a critical direct reference to reinventing icarus as the empowered artist and associating him with the bird symbol analyzing other repeated references references to the bird symbol in the text i show that through this symbol in the bird girl stephen invokes himself as satan who is both fallen and defiant but also redeemed in the bird girl in other words with repeated references of the metaphors of silence exile impalpability as well as symbols of the bird stephen's triumphant and redeemed as well as the lost and fallen masculinity is projected onto the bird girl analyzing other references i also show that with the same metaphors of impalpability as is the case of mercedes the redeemed maternal feminine of the irish nation as well as the tortured or effeminized aspects of stephen's subjectivity are projected on the bird girl after his intense encounter with the bird girl whom he calls a wild angel stephen cries out in quote gates of all ways of error and glory end quote have opened to him critically articulating his epiphany he says to live to err to fall to triumph to recreate life out of life these words show that stephen reinvents the religious narrative of fall and redemption through art <clears throat> earlier contemplating the priesthood which he rejects after all he remarks he would confess and repent and be absolved confess and repent again and be absolved again fruitlessly within the catholic narrative stephen is told that to confess confess and repent his fallen status and to resolve again to obey the religious dictates comprise redemption in his artist version stephen submits himself to the movement of desire that is he inherits his fallen that is divided and conflicted ideological subjectivity that includes his misperceived wholeness and his lacks or divisions constituted by nation language and religion and by projecting these onto the bird girl he finds his triumph out of it that is he finds the trace the element that remains outside signification and ideology coming to the final point as noted earlier the fetish object galvanizes contradictions in cultural values by at once embodying a culture's desire for wholeness or sovereignty and also the values that contradict and divide this ideal of sovereignty <clears throat> the fetish also produces engagement among these two forms of identity as whole and divided i argue that when invoked for emancipation purposes in the colonial context the fetish produces a post colonial freedom construct briefly here is how i demonstrate this homi baba suggests that the post colonial agency resides in the third space which can be understood as a negotiatory space or position between the colonial subject and its discursive other what we see here is by embodying various aspects of stephen's subjectivity including his misperceived wholeness as well as others of this wholeness 
which are his lacks or divisions, all of which are founded in various contradictory values embedded in colonial Ireland. The vertical image produces engagement among these and produces a post-colonial freedom construct. This freedom construct has the post-colonial cosmopolitan ambition as it remains discursive, which is to say in Bill Ashcroft's words, it remains open to its others in its cosmopolitan ambition. Yet this construct emerges only by attending to the local ideological values embedded in colonial Ireland. Thank you. Okay, we could unmute ourselves or do the hand applause as Dave Fossum is doing. Great, okay, thanks everybody. Thank you all. Yeah, okay, wonderful. So our second speaker is Nick Miller who is the author of Voice of Deliverance, the language of Martin Luther King Jr. and its sources, and Martin Luther King's biblical epic, His Final Great Speech. His essays on King, Malcolm X, Frederick Douglass, C.L. Franklin, Fanny Lou Hammer, Jackie Robinson, I'm sorry, Hamer, Jackie Robinson, and Critical Race Theory have appeared in flagship journals and in many scholarly collections. His essay on I Have a Dream Teresa Inos Award for Best Essay of the Year in Rhetoric Review. He has taught at Tex Texas Christian, Ohio State, and I meant to ask you about this. Um, Keith, will you unmute yourself and pronounce this uh, university in South Korea? Sean Buck. Thank you. Sean Buck University, and has lectured at Columbia, Stanford, University of Alabama, Penn State, Florida State, San Diego State, and elsewhere. He is currently a fellowship at the National Humanity Center in Raleigh, North Carolina, um, uh, where he is working on a book tentatively titled Rethinking Malcolm X. I'm telling you the national memory is wrong and how to fix it. The title of Keith Miller's talk today is Malcolm X's North Star, Marcus. And uh, either I or um, Isaac Jocelyn will be showing uh, the PowerPoints. I was having a bit of a glitchiness yesterday, and if that's the case, which I suspect it will be, Isaac will be showing them. Keith, um, should I pull them up? Yeah, please do that. That'd be great. And then whatever kind of code you develop to to send uh, uh, me or to send me or Isaac onto the next slide, we'll figure that out. I'll just raise my hand. There's one point where we need to go back to a previous slide. Uh, I'm gonna, but I'll tell you. All right, one moment, please. <clears throat> Isaac, can you yeah. take it away? I can share them. Just okay, one. thank you. So I'm ready to go here? Should be, just tell me when to switch. Okay, thanks. Uh, I'll just raise my hand. Perfect. Um, thank you all for coming. It's great to see all of you. I really appreciate this. Uh, I know you've got a lot of demands on your time and you know we're all trying to put up with COVID. Um, even though I have a strong interpretation, I'm still working on this. I'm still working on my book proposal. I'm trying to send in a book proposal. Um, in a few days, uh, but you may be able to help me, even though I have a strong, what's gonna sound like a strong interpretation, you may be able to help me uh, with part of it. Okay, to start with, um, the Autobiography of Malcolm X is an extremely important book. It's been a gigantic bestseller. It's sold millions and millions of copies and it's had an enormous influence on the national memory of Malcolm X and also on the biographers. And uh, it's been called a classic of American autobiography. It's been called the fundamental text for the study of um, the study of uh, Malcolm X. Uh, and this is basically my kind of summary of it. Uh, it portrays his life as a series of dramatic self transformations. He free falls from an innocent suffering child in Lansing into Detroit Red, which is the all of these names are chapter titles. Detroit Red is a fully fledged, utterly hedonistic gangster and drug addict and pimp in Boston and Harlem. 
Then he gets in prison for burglary and he plummets into Satan, a supremely evil prison inmate. While incarcerated, he leaps upward into an earnest, uh, that should be bookworm. He, he becomes an earnest bookworm and a, a Puritan, a puritanical convert to the nation of Islam, which is a, a, a homegrown, highly unorthodox uh, variation of Islam. After gaining great national attention as Minister Malcolm X, uh, he achieves a form of transcendence through an epiphany in Mecca, which prompts him to become a nonviolent integrationist and an orthodox Sunni Muslim. So these are these very dramatic uh, pivot on a pivot on a dime kind of transformations. That's basically the plot. Okay. Okay, Isaac. Uh, so millions of copies, and as I said, it's impacted a lot of people. Uh, the Pulitzer Prize winning biography of 2011 is called Malcolm X, colon, A Life of Reinvention uh, uh, by Manning Marable, and he and others write about his self-transformation, his spiritual conversion, and his uh, Satori-like epiphany in prison. So I'm going to focus on the prison part of it. Um, uh, in the Q&A, if you want to, we can go talk about the Mecca part of it, but I, don't, I, I can't go into everything. Okay, next. So I challenge this whole, this whole plot. I think this whole plot is all wrong. I don't think this is Malcolm X. And my research in the archives in Library of Congress, Columbia, Schomburg Archive in Harlem, uh, which has, a, the, Schomburg has a huge cache of documents of handwritten speeches, letters, and diaries and radio sermons by Malcolm X that his widow kept secreted in her basement and that didn't get into the Schomburg until 2004. So they weren't available to a lot of people before that, the, the scholars, but, and since 2004, there haven't been that many people working on Malcolm X. But these uh, unexamined and underutilized, uh, some of them are not used at all, and some of them are un underutilized. They demonstrate that uh, the editors heavily intervene in creating autobiography. So I claim that autobiography is not only written by Alex Haley, his collaborator Malcolm X, as everybody has said, but that the editors, and there are two different sets of editors, they intervene heavenly, they, they got rid of the African-American vernacular English, uh, they got rid of the speeches that he originally wanted included in the book, um, and they were, they were monkeying around with the book after he died. So, and you can see this in the archives at the Library of Congress by his uh, white editors who, you know, had no sympathy for his point of view because when he started the book, he, he thought white people were the devil and they were, they were at the top of the food chain on the, uh, in the publication world. Okay. So this is my version of his, his life, especially his early life. Uh, his parents, Earl and Louise Little, met in Montreal and they attended meetings of Marcus Garvey's organization, United Negro Improvement Association. They moved to Omaha and Earl became a, an evangelist for Garvey and he preached Garvey's uh, message in churches. And Louise was a writer and she wrote for Garvey's newspaper. She's in Omaha, she's writing for Garvey's newspaper in, in Harlem and her articles appear under her own byline. So Malcolm X is born in 1925 and the family in Omaha, but the family moves to Milwaukee and then it moves to Lansing. Uh, and every time they move, Earl and Louise Little move into an all white area, not because they want to assimilate, but because they don't want to be ghettoized. They don't want to follow the white people's idea of where they're supposed to live. Okay. So we, I got to look at Marcus Garvey. Okay, Marcus Garvey's heyday is between 1915 and 1925. He led an unprecedented global organization, United Negro Improvement Association, UNIA, with branches in 40 countries and hundreds of thousands of followers, uh, including, you know, a branch in Omaha, right? So he did not like the idea of integration at all. He thought immigration was totally unworkable and this is a, when all these lynchings are going on all over the place and the NAACP can't, not only can they not establish equality, they can't even stop the lynchings. So in Harlem, he orchestrated and he wrote in these big parades. He, wrote, he wore these military like uh, uniforms and he wore big plumed hats. Uh, and he's trying to promote racial solidarity and racial pride. 
And one large parade moved all the way from Harlem downtown to uh, Madison Square Garden, and he uh, he gave a speech to a packed house at Madison Square Garden. But W.E.B. Du Bois hated him, and the other integrationists hated him. Uh, and he got dispatched to federal prison in 1925 for the bogus charge of mail fraud. Now, the overlap with Malcolm X's timeline is important because Malcolm X was born in 1925. After he, then he gets deported to uh, Jamaica in 1927. Uh, the UNIA, his organization, almost disappears. He dies in 1940. So. But Earl and Louise Little cling to Garvey, even though Garvey has gone downhill everywhere else and he's, he's in prison and then he's in Jamaica. So what are his principles? Passionate and unwavering identification of white supremacy as the dominant political and cultural force in both Africa and the US. A force that wreaked enormous damage and destruction across Africa and the entire African diaspora. There weren't too many white professors at this time who were making this argument. This is in 1920. He viewed whites as extremely resistant to grasping anything approaching the full economic, political, religious, and psychosocial dimensions of white supremacy and its per pervasive and extremely damaging impact around the world. The whites were clueless about this. He disdained assimilationist African-American elites in the NAACP. They were all middle class and he disdained them uh, and they disdained him. He thought hope was gonna come from a visible populist movement fueled by racial pride and framed in biblical language. Uh, he rejected the assumption that the constitution and the American government would ever overthrow white supremacy. It ain't gonna happen, he said. Du Bois, you're living in a dream world. Okay, next. He also repudiated the whole tradition of African-American oratory called the Jeremiah that appeals to American and Christian ideals that's embodied by Frederick Douglass and a whole string of people, Ida B. Wells, and a whole string of, string of people after that. And it goes on to uh, Martin Luther King. Uh, he thinks that everybody in the African diaspora shares comic, economic, cultural, political, psychosocial interests in a common destiny. And this, is, this outweighs all the differences. All the differences around the world, Africa, Middle, uh, West Indies, Harlem, UK, it doesn't matter where you live in. Everybody has the same uh, kind of a political interest. So the faith in Pan-Africanism is his source of hope for overturning the whites' uh, domination. And he's trying to promote black entrepreneurship leading to wealth creation instead of working for minimum wages uh, for whites. Uh, you never kowtow to the racist whites. He also, he, he also, the UNIA was a kind of a personality cult around, surrounding uh, Garvey. And he used some religious language from the Bible and African-American churches uh, to sort of sanctify himself. Okay, Malcolm X's upbringing. His parents instilled the Garvey principles in their children, including Malcolm. They even took their kids to a Saturday school, a Garveyite Saturday school. His mother chastised the teachers in the elementary school for, for trying to treat him like he's inferior. Uh, when he's four years old, the white supremacists torch the house that they're living in and the house burns down. The whole family is inside the house. They escape in the middle of the night in their pajamas. So the white supremacists try to murder the whole family. Malcolm is four years old. Two years later, his father is run over by a streetcar and dies in a hideous, sudden way. So Malcolm is dealing with all this trauma. This happens when he's four years old and six years old. Now, this is not a good time because it's the Great Depression. So his mother is trying valiantly to survive and to you know, eat the, the, grow the garden and eat the vegetables and eat the chickens and the rabbits and sell them to the neighbors. Uh, but her breadwinner is gone and she's got seven children. And, uh, the white welfare workers offer her food, but she's too proud and she turns down the, she rejects the boxes of fruit, food. Okay. After seven years of poverty during the Great Depression with no running water in the house, uh, Louise finally snaps and the, the, white, the whites are finally show up, they decide to show up and uh, they escort her to an asylum. 
and then they scattered the children in foster homes. So there's more trauma. There's a, a, there's a chronic trauma of the hunger and the struggle during the depression. And then there's more trauma when the mother is institutionalized and the children all scattered. So Malcolm at age 15, he drops out of, he drops out of school and he moves to, from Michigan to Boston to live with his half sister. So he won't go to school. He never goes to school again. He's with his sister, his half sister, Ella, and he joins this kind of a jazz counterculture and hangs around the jazz clubs and wears these extremely colorful outfits uh, with neon colors uh, called zoot suits. And he's smoking marijuana and he, he gets this white trophy lover that he's escorting around uh, Boston and Harlem. Um, and he, my interpretation, he uses the marijuana and the cocaine to, to, to self-medicate because of all the trauma. When he gets convicted of bur burglary, he gets a very long prison sentence because he's being punished for having a white girlfriend who gets caught in burglary with him. Uh, but all this time he's resisting, he's, he's Garveyite in a certain way and that he's resisting assimilation and he's defying the white, uh, white cultural norms by hanging around with a white girlfriend. So when he's in prison at age 23, at age 21, at age 23, his brother, his older brother, Wilfred, decides to join the Nation of Islam. And Wilfred explains in interviews and in a speech that he did that because the Nation of Islam resembled Garvey, resembled Garvey's organization. That's why he joined it. And the other siblings joined the Nation of Islam. And then some of them went all the way from Michigan to Massachusetts, where Malcolm X is in prison, and convince him to join them. So by joining them, he's not doing a self-transformation or a spiritual conversion. What he's doing is he's reuniting with his siblings. He's reuniting with the Garvey principles because the Garvey principles that I went over earlier are the same principles as the Nation of Islam. The Nation of Islam says well, white people are never going to change. We have to separate from whites. We have to. We have to. Uh, do African-American entrepreneurship. Um, and we have to be united together. The integration is never gonna work. The same principles that Garvey had. Now the nation of Islam is also a highly unorthodox version of Islam. And there's this Islamic, quasi-Islamic kind of philosophy that goes along with it. But this is that, that to, to if I went over the tenants, you would all think it was pretty weird. But that's not why Wilfred joined the Nation of Islam. He joined it because they resembled Garvey and because he said they're helping, they try to recruit the people who are the most down and out, the alcoholics, the drug addicts, the prostitutes, the prisoners, the former prisoners, all the people lying in the gutter. That's the people that they care about and they're trying to resurrect them and they achieve a remarkable success in doing that. And the NAACP doesn't care about these people because they're all middle-class people in the NAACP. Okay, next. So I claim this is not a conversion at all. And it's not a Satori-like moment. And it's not a self-transformation. And it's not a reinvention. There ain't no reinvention. What he's doing is the opposite. He is bonding back with his siblings who are the only tie he has to his childhood identity and to his parents' Garveyite principles that they all share. So he's bonding with them. He gets out of prison and he moves to Michigan and joins the Nation of Islam and becomes a minister. This is not a surprise. Now, when he converts to the Nation of Islam, he's 23, he goes to prison at 21. He's 23 when he converts to the Nation of Islam. So what is this? This is okay. It's not a, it's not a transformation or reinvention. What is it? Maturation. He grew up. It's so simple. I don't understand why people haven't figured this out. This is what I think. So, like me and some other twenty-three-year-olds, including Barack Obama, who spent much of his youth smoking marijuana and snorting cocaine. Read David Garrell's biography. That's what, Mar that's what Bar Barack Obama and millions of other people did. They rebelled and they take drugs and they sleep with too many different people. And you know, right, uh, how many people do this? Millions of people. 
And then at age 23, what do they do? They grow up. At age 23, age 25. So was his coming of age delayed? Well, maybe. But if that's true, it's due to the extreme trauma. But I, I think he came of age at the same time Obama did. And Obama didn't get his house burned when he was four years old. So Elijah Muhammad became a, a substitute father figure for Malcolm and his core principles overlapped those of Garvey, which is why they joined it. So this is not a deviation and it's not a conversion. This is a, a, an act of continuity. Okay. So Malcolm X also moved the nation of Islam People depict him as like he's slavishly following Elijah Muhammad, and he seems to be in certain kind of ways, but to me, that's on the surface. He, he cites Elijah Muhammad, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad teaches us this, this, and this. He's citing that all the time when he's doing speeches and interviews. However, the assumption that people have is that Elijah Muhammad doesn't change. My argument is that Malcolm X changes Elijah Muhammad because Elijah Muhammad is stuck in an insular uh, in his insularity in Chicago and Detroit with very few followers. Malcolm X is the one who recruits, believe it or not, thousands of followers in Detroit, in Boston, in Harlem, and then flying around everywhere else because he's so eloquent. And Elijah Muhammad is not very eloquent, to say the least. So, but Malcolm wanted to internationalize the whole thing, and he, he pushed Pan-Africanism because he met with heads of state from Africa when they would fly into the U to talk to the UN, he would meet him at the airport. And when Castro came to, uh, to New York, he met with Castro in a, in a hotel in Harlem. And this has uh, got a lot of news. So he's always in the news and he's, he's always getting interviewed and, and he's publicizing the nation of Islam, which never would have happened without Malcolm X. So it's in 1964, he visits Africa and his African nation and he meets the heads of state, some of whom he already met at the airport in New York. So my argument is the consistency of his Pan-Africanism reflects this international point of view, reflects his lifelong commitment to Garvey's principles. Okay. So I think that people's interpretation of because the scholars are so influenced by our autobiography of Malcolm X and by the Spike Lee movie, which is based on it, they don't give any credit. They don't give anywhere near enough credit to the parents. The parents are the formative influence on Malcolm X. And it's not Elijah Muhammad. And it's not anybody in Mecca. Uh, this narrative belittles and disrespects the parents because it says that he's inventing himself by himself. He's doing this isolated self-invention and reinvention. This narrative also belittles and shortchanges the great bulwark of African-American life, which is the family. Herbert Gutman, who's a great historian, documents the ability of African-American families to hold themselves together, even during slavery, even when people are sold down to different states. So the father and the mother and the sister and brother sold to different states and they still may be, they found a way to maintain these family networks. And this is exactly what happened with the little family, despite all the trauma visited on them by the white supremacists. They maintained their family. The family was one of the unsinkable families that Gutman talks about. He doesn't explicitly talk about the family, but they, they fit into what he's saying. So, by following his siblings, he sticks to the Garvier principles. He creates more family solidarity. The remarkable fact of his life is the opposite of self-transformation. It is his extraordinary continuity and consistency. He clung to his parents' Garvier principles, which he inhaled as a child. He never transformed at all. The transformations are little adaptations but they're not basic at all to his identity. This is my argument. Thank you. Yes, we could unmute ourselves and um, thank you so much, Keith. Thank you, Bina, and thank you, Isaac, as well, for technical support. Um,
And Sahar, thank you for um, technical support as well, just as an FYI. She's very tech savvy and told me about text that you see at the bottom of your screen, which I didn't know existed before today. Um, so, or, so now we have time for a Q&A. And I will open it up. If you have a question, just um, either physically put your hand up or put some kind of emoji hand up. Dan, go ahead. Uh, oh, wait a minute. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so Keith, what about at the end of his life? Do you still see that as in a sort of continuity with uh, um, with Garveyite principles? Uh, yeah. Do you? Uh, okay. The autobiography says that he goes to Egypt and Saudi Arabia and does his pilgrimage to Mecca in 1964. However, and then he decides that, okay, when he's in Mecca, he decides that people of all races are equal. Right. However, it's complicated, but even the autobiography has one or two sentences that said that he went to Egypt and Saudi Arabia in 1959, five years earlier. Hmm. And in 1959, he would have seen the same devout Muslims of all races that he saw in 1964. So the question is, why didn't he notice that there were devout Muslims of all races in 1959? Hmm. And actually he did notice. And we know that because he wrote an article in the Pittsburgh Courier that's in print in a book that says that in 1959, right when he gets back, he writes an article and he says, oh, I met, I met devout Muslims of all races. So to me, his disillusion with, with, disillusionment with Elijah, Elijah Muhammad was not precipitous, but it was very, very gradual. And Orthodox Muslims in the US challenged him for years, starting at least in 1960, including students at UCLA, right? And some very obscure people, they challenged him and they said, you know, Nation of Islam is not real Islam. It's, it's phony Islam. And eventually he came to their, he, he defends the Nation of Islam, including in a couple of columns, one of them, and, and in a letter to the New York Times, but he, he later comes to the same conclusion. His critics were criticizing him and say, okay, well, it's not real Islam. And he later says the same thing. So it's a very gradual kind of a process that's misrepresented in the autobiography about Malcolm X because they're trying to get a lot of drama in the book as much as they can. So they don't want anything to happen gradually, even though it actually did happen gradually. Um, and I think he always had, even though he's preaching separatism and he's preaching, um, you got to get away from whites, he's attacking Martin Luther King. Even though he's doing that, he always has some kind of a dual attitude or ambivalent attitude toward whites because he's interviewed by white broadcast journalists and print journalists on a regular basis. And because they always think he's friendly. And one of them was Mike Wallace, who later became famous on 60 Minutes. And Mike Wallace has an autobiography. He says that Malcolm X was a friend. So he has these friendly relationships with this stable of reporters. Mm -hmm. And when he goes to Mecca in 1964, he writes a letter to the New York Times reporter, who's a white guy and says, oh, I, I saw these people in Mecca and you know, I had to change, change your heart. But, and he also speaks at white universities, predominantly white universities, Harvard, Yale, Michigan, all kinds of universities, UCLA. So if white people are really the devil, which is the doctrine of the nation of Islam, then 
why are you even talking to these white students? It's kind of illogical. And the people in Elijah Muhammad's inner circle didn't like it. So he, to me, he's always, there's always this kind of ambivalence about whites. Mm -hmm. And he also protests the mistreatment of a guy who was beaten by the NYPD in Harlem in 1957. And he, he has a racial protest. You mistreated this guy. So why do you protest if the whites, you know, if it's impossible to change their minds? So I think he's ambivalent about it all along. Okay. Ambivalent, paradoxical, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. And please. Oh, Aaron. Yes. Please. Yeah, so um, Prof. Kate, um, from your presentation, are we concluding that Gave is a racist? Or can we conclude? And I mean, of course, there'll be a follow. <laughs> no, that's a really interesting question. I'm not yeah. sure exactly how to answer that question. He really did not believe in whites. I don't think he was ambivalent the way Malcolm X was. He just thought that we're not gonna get anywhere. We've got lynchings, we've got this white people slaughtering African-Americans in Wilmington, North Carolina, in Tulsa, uh, in East St. Louis, Atlanta. And you know, there's so much hostility that we're facing here that it, it, it's, it's kind of illogical to, for us to try to stay here. So we need to try to separate from whites. We need to try to set up our own economy to the extent that we can. The scholars disagree on exactly How many people was, was he thinking he could actually ship back to Africa? He did buy a couple of ships. Uh, he didn't actually get very many people to Africa. Uh, but exactly how was this separate racial community supposed to work? There's not a lot of details about that in Garvey. Um, I would see Garvey as more I don't see him as hate-filled. I see him as, toward whites. I see him as sort of more pragmatic. It's kind of like, why are you trying to integrate with these people? So, so Du Bois's argument is when well, he said we need to go fight in World War One. We'll go fight in World War One, and we'll be loyal. Then we'll come back, and then they'll you know they'll accept us, and then we'll push for it to be accepted. And but it didn't happen, right? They came back from World War One. They had fought in the in the in the trenches in Europe, and you know they weren't accepted when they came back. So Du Bois was wrong about that. Um, that makes me think of uh, Albert Memmi and the concept of defensive racism, which is rooted not in a belief in biological difference, but in um, you know uh, social actions that have been taken. I'm a big fan of Memmi, so. Um, all right, uh, Toby Harper, please. You have a question? So, oh, yes, yeah, sorry. Toby, you're mute. Oh, sorry. Uh, I, I thought I was, I thought I was, um, I thought I was unmuting myself. But, Aaron, did you want to follow up on your question? Yes, I was going to make a follow up, but you, I mean. Right. Oh. That. Um, please go ahead. I should go ahead. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. So, so um, I read Cohen's The Postcolonial Middle Ages and extrapolated this concept of will the black subjects ever be free? You know, and and relating it to um, Prof. Kate's um, point on Gavi, I'm I'm asking whether is it not reinforcing Cohen's point? you know, that can the black subject ever be free? Now, um, this question also reinforces my own appreciation of issues of racism um, and saying that I think that it may not end, but the fact that both the black and the white subject must learn to live side by side each other because 
everybody wants to be at the, or nobody wants to be at the margins of society. Everybody in his own, her own way, ways want to, want to be the center of attraction. And so when we look at the attraction point at both, both ends in this, as far as the white subject and the black subject is concerned, is the solution not that we learn to live side by side and kind of pretend as if nothing has happened. Take advantage of all the opportunities that life presents us in our own ways and better the lot of our lives. Mm -hmm. So um, also reinforces Dor Dorothy West's, you know, um, why she got into trouble with Du Bois as far as racial um, difference is concerned. Because for Dorothy West, you know, it's all about affirming yourself, asserting yourself, whatever you find yourself, whether you are black or white, and not be bothered by what somebody else thinks about you. You know, and, and, and fighting one another surely doesn't solve any problem, but you, every individual should take advantage of what, whatever opportunities that life presents him or her and make the best out of the situation. So, um, so the, the question, the follow-up question is simply this. Uh, Cohen's point that is, can the black man ever be free? You know, is it re-emphasizing and re-reinforcing um, Gave's own notions of racism? Uh, that's a great question, and uh, I need to read Cohen. Yeah. So, I don't know what, uh, the, don't know what yeah, to say. The, the, the title of his the book is The, the Postcolonial Middle Ages. Okay, thank you for that, Aaron. This is Dean Jeffrey Cohen from 2000. Yeah. Yeah. Toby, go ahead. Okay, uh, this is this is sort of a question for both. It's a bit vague, but it's, it's probably more for Bina, because um, I think I think uh, it, it it was clearer from Keith's. Um, I, and I I'm really interested in in think in what is it the the thing in common here, which is that they're both these are both figures who are associated with a specific like Irish and American or like a specific place, but they're both, but you're, but you're, um, you're both uh, looking at them in terms of sort of more global post-colonial um, framework. And I, I, I get, I get, so I, sorry, this is very vague. I guess I, I just wanted to ask about how how that changes the story. I, I think with Keith's example, I think it's really interesting that this is to think of Malcolm X as from the beginning international, sort of have, having knowing about international movements. Um, but uh, well, so what about for, for James Joyce? You know, how, how does thinking of him in a, um, in a kind of international, in, in you know, the early 20th century, the kind of, with all that's going on in the world, uh, at the time, how, how does that change how people should think about or read Joyce? Oh, thank you for that question. So <clears throat> I think that is, um, that is one of the really important implications um, what you just uh, asked, because I think that um, one way to, because the way I analyze um, Joyce or this particular text of Joyce is not to look at, you know, Stephen's words or Joyce's words or Joyce's implied intent or whether Stephen is Joyce's mouthpiece, whether he's an ironical representation. I look at it as um, kind of a dialogic um, um, contact between the author and um, the character. And so it is a textual approach. And I think that um, <clears throat> what, what Joyce is trying to do is, um, because the way it is, it has been understood is that he's trying to create this um, aesthetic perception, this freedom narrative, which is utopian and which is transcendent, which, which has nothing to do with reality, which has nothing to do with um, the ideologies that he's confronting. 
And what I'm showing is that, in fact, uh, the, the way he comes, the text comes to define freedom shows that Joyce is really engaging with ideologies. And he is neither creating a parochial sense of um, uh, narrow sense of utopian ideal for the Irish race or Irish subjectivity, nor he is, um, nor he is creating some kind of um, cosmopolitan version, which gets always accused of discursivity and um, not having any kind of local resonance. Um, if we really understand, and, and that is my broader point, that uh, if we really understand um, some of the uh, culturally significant material objects, and if we focus on those, we try to see how uh, some of the contradictions get galvanized um, by these material objects. Uh, and in, in this particular case, uh, in, in my other uh, chapter I talk about Gandhi, and that is uh, he. There are two uh, material objects: uh, the charkha, the spinning wheel, and the homespun uh, fabric. But here, in even in fiction, uh, he is attending to the historical realities, and um, so the the answer to the question is that if we really focus on some of these narratives, we see that they had they had this vision that was truly post-colonial and. Um, the way it, it is relevant today uh, is that um, we can focus on this. This is a new way to understand uh, what I'm arguing is to, to look at um, material objects or images um, or even, even particular, um, particular um, cultural figures who, uh, who become reified and uh, start embodying projections um, of the culture. And um, it, it kind of represents a new form of social consciousness. It represents that hybrid form of social consciousness that moves us forward. If we look at what contradictions, um, because as I said, the, the way I theorize it is that the fetish represents a culture's desire for wholeness, means all cultures, um, in, in their local communities or, or in their broader communities, they want to define values that, uh, that they can identify with. So they all have, all cultures, communities have desire for identifying themselves with that sovereignty. But the way it get, the fetish galvanizes it in ways so that this particular wholeness also remains engaged with the divisions that are part of the contradictions in culture, the values that threaten the wholeness. So if we look at these contradictions and if we look at how, um, how they are getting uh, engaged and if we interpret these cultural um, uh, icons or, or images or objects, we would be able to see how they lead us forward to a new form of social consciousness and move us forward into that post-colonial consciousness. Did, did I answer that? Did I answer that? <laughs> okay. Sorry, yeah, yeah, no, that, that, I think that, that's really helpful, thanks. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, go ahead. So what do you, how do you make sense of his last book, Finnegan's Wake, in this process? In other words, what kind of stance do you think it implies as to culture, if we see culture as something that divides as much as melts together. I mean, it, it's written in a language that no one has ever spoken. Uh, mm -hmm. And anyway, I just wondered what you, what you yeah, thought that, about that. Yeah, that's a very interesting question, but I, I haven't thought about that. I, uh, okay. I will definitely think about that. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, okay. I, I will definitely think about that. <laughs> <clears throat> I mean, it takes a strange, odd, position on cultural authority and cultural difference because mm -hmm. on the one hand we can recognize some of parts of the words <laughs> if we know right. enough western languages but right. uh, the the actual process of reading that book is a very strange process for yes um, yes 
Yes, and and I uh, definitely I will I will uh, think about how it compares with that, uh, and um, I, I was kind of more interested in finding uh, this fetish objects um, that are that have any relevance to uh, this freedom narrative. So so this one really fit very well, but I will definitely think about that. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, I, I, um, it's my fault that we uh, started late because of technical difficulties, but we have gone over. So I think um, we should wrap up. I just wanted to mention because this conversation, the end of this conversation borders on um, aesthetics and the post-colonial and Isaac has some interest in that, which you mentioned recently. I just wanted to know if you wanted to say anything about that. Yeah, or sure, real quick since we are over time. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank both Keith and Bina for very fascinating presentations that I think really uh, bring a lot of ideas into, into dialogue. Um, and uh, with that in mind, I'd like to propose the potential to discuss this notion further in the context of their next meeting this semester. Uh, if any of you would be willing or interested in participating, or if you know someone who's interested in questions of experimental aesthetics and how those kinds of questions can embody socio and cultural issues, um, please do send us a message um, and we would be happy to facilitate that uh, talk.